so I'm going to be very sensitive because I think this is being recorded in live stream, not to spoil for those who haven't seen it. Obviously, you guys just did. Um, but what was your reaction when you first read the script? I mean, did it did it move and have all the layers even even on the on the page as it does here? Yeah, I mean, my f my first connection and my first experience of it was actually just Alice because I was sent the sides to read for Steve to audition for it. Um, and is often the way now as an actor, you often just get sent just your scenes, you know, that they want you to read. Um, so my connection was her first and foremost, and I and I felt such huge, deep, visceral compassion for her. Um, she would just grab me from the second I read her and I had to play her. Um, I read the script once I had the role and I was, I, I was astonished by how much Gillian and Steve managed to thread through the script. But, you know, it's so interesting as an actor because you do your piece and you play your piece of the puzzle. But the first time I sat down and watched this film, I, I was amazed at what they managed to pull off. And it just runs the gamut. I mean, there's no stone left unturned, um, but with such compassion and such humanity and such efficiency, you know. And I think that that's Steve's sort of trademark as a filmmaker, that he, he takes you to all those places. You're sort of there before you even know you're there, and then it's done and you've experienced something incredible. I mean, there, there probably are six or seven or eight narratives going at one time here. So yeah, I mean, was that an experience to watch it? I mean, because you're in probably a third of the film, but like there's whole sections that must have just wowed you the same way it did the audience. Yeah, I mean, I'll never forget watching Daniel Kaluuya's work in this. I mean, yeah, it's frightening. It's frightening. Yeah. Um, I, w I actually, my experience of watching this film was watching it with Michelle. We both happened to be in London and Fox was, was holding a screening. And neither of us told each other that we were going because we were both sort of trying, you know, it's a really scary thing to watch your work for the first time. So I was sat in the cinema and I, I didn't sort of tell her I was going and then she kind of sheepishly walked in the door and I looked at her, I was like, okay, let's do it. And we were sort of like on opposite sides of the, of the you know, a cinema like this size and, and I just could not sit still through Daniel's work. I mean, it was, it's so visceral that this the, the the scene in that bowling alley is like I've never seen anything like it. And even the the camera shot around him in that gym and yeah. but there's something about um you know what Steve does because I mean there is a lot of violence in this film. And yet the sort of access point of it is something to do with again efficiency and speed or something. I can't quite explain it and, and how he tackles the issue of police brutality as well. It's something about the speed of it uh, that's so true to life, I think. Yeah, and, and also, I mean, credit to him and to Gillian Flynn um, and to all of you who found sort of moments of lightness and humor. And I want to say it's just so uh, interesting that you're playing a Polish-American girl living in Chicago and your mom is one of the great Australian actresses of Go all figure, time. right? Jackie yeah. Weaver. Yeah. But she, you know, she's terrifying, but she's also really darkly comic. She, I mean, Jackie Weaver, as an Australian, Jackie Weaver is, you know, a, like a living legend for us. I mean, when I walked into the office in Chicago one morning and Ian Canning, our incredible producer, sort of stuck his head out the door and he went, oh, guess who's playing your mum, Jackie Weaver? And I was like, what? <laughs> Shut the front door. What? I mean, like, what? What are the odds? Um, also, Jackie comes up to my hip. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> which we adore, which we love very much. I mean, that scene when she sort of drags me off the bed and then stands me up and I look like a rag doll. She's literally coming up to my hip. Um, you know, the first... I mean, Jackie is, is, has this incredible intellect as an actress and huge amount of empathy, but she's so funny. It's sort of savage in a way. And the first time I really noticed it um, was in the funeral scene. Which is, you know, it's quite quick again when you see all these snippets of, of how these women are dealing with their grief. And, you know, we were in this great big huge Polish um, Catholic church in the middle of Chicago. And, and, uh, and, you know, we did quite a few takes of it and I got snottier and snottier and redder and pinker. I mean, I'm so pink in that scene. It's like this. <laughs> it's not my prettiest face. Um, and, um, and people behind the monitor just got 
just laughed more and more and more the more I cried, which felt incredibly cruel. Um, but it was Jackie because, you know, there's something about the sort of... I mean, I, th I also think what she does and, 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 you know, we only have those two scenes together really, but the conversation that springs up around it about sort of matriarchal abuse and the repression of, of the mother and the projection of the mother and the, the sort of, the you know, living vicariously through the child, but also this kind of reckoning that Alice goes through to not replicate her mother. I mean, because I think what this... The, so the, the, the conversation this film has about maternal love is really profound. Like, you really see it in so many different variations. I mean, what Viola does in terms of the sort of journey of grief she goes on losing her son and then, you know, what Michelle... Michelle plays such an incredible matriarch, this figure, you know, who... Today when we were doing a Q&A, she was talking about that sort of incredible thing that, that women have, that adrenaline that they will lift a car off their child if they need to. And, you know, she engages in that heist because of, because of her child. And so does Cynthia's character, Belle. Um, and Alice's sort of relationship with this maternal situation in her life is kind of the opposite. You know, she, in that scene, she looks at her mother and she says, I just, I just can't. I don't want to be you, you know, I won't replicate that. But it takes her a while to get there. Well, I mean, all of Steve, he's made four feature films, Steve McQueen, and they're all um, about people who are trapped in some way. I mean, 12 Years a Slave is, is literally about that, but shame is about being trapped in one's own addiction. Um, did you see that as an area to explore? You just were just talking about it now, and I'm curious if you, you obviously knew all of his work. Um, I do, <laughs> You had also worked with Michael Fassbender in Macbeth a couple of years ago. That's right, yeah. Who has been in every Steve McQueen film except for this one. Right. Well, he was going to play Alice, but he was busy. So <laughs> shame. Did, shame. I mean, Steve no pun intended. is a very big personality. I mean, he's, he's wonderful. Um, had you met him before you began work on this? Yes, I met him once at a party. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was brief. Um, he asked, he asked me when I was um, going to do some proper acting. <laughs> and I said, when are you going to give me a job? <laughs> um, you know, Steve is an incredible man and the most honest, um, sensitive, really remarkable human being I've ever been given the chance to work with. Um, he sort of demands nothing less than your soul. Um, and I think you see that when you watch this film, but th the amazing thing about Steve is you, you just want to give it to him because you know it's in such good hands. And it's, it's kind of the sweetest spot to be in as an actor that you have this material that's so beautifully written and you have this character that I is already living in your heart and then you come to a set where your director is, has so intelligently designed the sort of psychological space within which you find yourself working. It's sort of like a bubble that springs up around us and and you just know that whatever you give in front of that camera that day is being captured and and um, sort of held in like a really beautiful way that um, it's not about like the work is respected or not respected. It's, it's sort of like you just know it's in the best possible hands. So you want to, you want to give everything, you know, and I mean, there were days on this set that I'll never forget that scene between Viola and I. I mean, I felt like we both, I remember <laughs> looking, we were looking at each other before we started doing that scene. And it was like, like a gladiator ring, you know, like we looked at each other and we were like, are we going to do this? I think we're going to do this. And Steve just sort of was like the mediator. He just stood back and let us, you know, because it was like a wrestling match, like a psychological wrestling match, you know, but I mean, what? I, you don't want anything else as an actor than, than that day on set, so. Um, I know it's a cliche for me to ask you about your height. Uh, everyone does, and I, I'm sorry to bring it up because it's okay. always, my, I have a sister who's six foot two and she um, hated being tall when she was in high school mm -hmm. and then kind of loved it when she became an adult. Do you share that experience at all? Because, I mean, um, I can link it to your career in, by saying that one of the coolest characters in American literature, and one of the tallest characters is Jordan Baker in The Great Gatsby. 
who you got to play for Baz Luhrmann, um, one of your first big movies. Um, I mean, a, a petite actress can't, can't play that part, you know, a, a five foot two actress. So did you see how it became sort of an advantage um, in, in your career as you started acting a lot? So <laughs> being tall is something I have nothing to do with. <laughs> I just am. And it's not something I ever think about because just like, you know, um, anything about your physical appearance that you can't alter, you, one would hope it doesn't sort of plague you on a daily basis because there's nothing you can do about it. So I don't ever really think about it. There have been times that I've been lucky to you sort of use it in a really graphic way and I love to do that. You know, I, I was in a Marvel movie and, and my director said, well, why don't we give you you know, two inch heels and you can be in a gold medal thing with a bald cap on. I was like, great, let's do that. That sounds fun. Um, you know, that's a, based on a comic book, so that's very visual. Um, you know, it's, yeah, people say, does it affect your career? I don't know. And my answer, truly, honestly, is uh, if I missed out on a job because I was too tall, my agent is not going to pick up the phone and say, look, they didn't give it to you because you're tall. Because what am I going to do? You know, cut my legs off. Like, what What can you do? Um, this movie and working with Steve was actually very seminal for me in terms of how I didn't realize that I was unconsciously compensating quite often in my life for being tall. Um, and I had a moment that I've spoken about a little, a little bit recently, and I sort of forgot about it actually, but a lot of the press we've been doing it's really interesting to do press in this film with Michelle and with Viola because the conversations are deep and, and, we, and it's very personal. And often when I'm answering questions about Alice, I get quite lost because I realize that there's not that much that separates me from her. And I think Viola and Michelle feel the same way. So, you know, and Viola was, has been very, very honest and vocal about her relationship to her image in this film and how, you know, when she started the process, she said to Steve, she called him up and she said, you know, I got... I've got five wigs, which one do you want? And Steve said, I want your hair, I don't want your wig. And how incredibly powerful that was for her. And I heard her say that the other day when we were doing press and I realized I had my moment of that about my height. And it was in the scene when I'm kissing David, played by Lucas Haas, and the, you know, at the, the, they're supposed to be going out for the day, but she's got this whole sort of agenda about the blueprints and, um, and the camera was sort of panning in a few times and Sean, I think he was on Steadicam, he sort of kept coming around and we were making out on the wall and, you know, it was, it was one of those scenes. You, you're just trying to get it done as fast as you can. I mean, Lucas House is lovely, nothing against <laughs> Lucas House. Um, and I couldn't figure out why we weren't getting it. I mean, I was like, I do, what am I doing wrong? There's only so many ways you can kiss somebody. And Steve sort of came up from behind the monitor and, and he was, you know, he looked really grumpy at me. I didn't know what, what I was doing and... No grumpy, he was just sort of like, come over here, come over here, I have to talk to you. And I sort of went over like the principal's office, I was like, oh shit, what am I doing wrong? And he just said to me, very, very seriously, he looked him in my eyes and he said, you put your feet on the wall and you stand up straight and let him come to you. And um, it sounds simple, but it was a big moment in my life, you know. Because it's so interesting in life, sometimes it takes somebody like Steve, someone that becomes like a a luminary figure in, in the sense that they illuminate things that, that you don't even know you're doing unconsciously to point out, um, by the way, you're doing this thing where you compensate for other people. Yeah. Um, maybe you should just try and be yourself and be proud of that. And I know that we all, I know Michelle had that, Viola and I had that, and I know Cynthia had it too, so. Uh, she must just be so extraordinary to, to be directed by. Um, Sarah Paulson, who's great, has not a big role in Toby's a Slave. I mean, she's, a, you know, supporting character but said that he talked a lot about um lift your chin so you so you're always looking down on people and whenever you touch anything always be wiping as if everything's dirty you know and the insight she said that she got into her own um instincts as an actor mm -hmm. were, were unbelievable just just from all the things he told her uh, is yeah i mean it's actually now i'm just even thinking um we did we had these really extraordinary camera tests before we started shooting. I mean, Sean Bobbitt, our cinematographer, is a, obviously a, 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 a just a genius. Um, we had these big camera tests in, in this warehouse um, space, and we, you know, we were testing. Obviously, I, I'm wearing a wig, and and Alice's wardrobe goes 
through a significant sort of psychological journey, which is credit to our amazing costume designer, Jenny Egan. Um, and we sort of, yeah, I mean, where we, f where we find Alice at the beginning of the story, she, she's, she's incredibly broken um, and, and really has internalized this, this sense of being worthless, which manifests in her body, you know. I mean, we see it on her face and it manifests in how she sort of moves through the world. And I always had this feeling of Alice's world being incredibly small. You know, when I first got to Chicago, I spent a lot of time just sort of, I had like two weeks and I just, went along, went on a lot of buses and I went to a lot of Polish churches and I ate in a lot of little diners and I just, I shared this one really quite intense encounter with somebody on a bus and it was, I'm not quite sure what happened but I obviously had annoyed him and he um, had a little go at me and I was just like, God, I'm just this Australian woman on a bus, I don't know where I'm going. Um, I got off the bus and Steve happened to call me and and he said, what's wrong? You sound really shaken. And I said, I don't know, I just, this guy was yelling at me on the bus. And there was this great big long pause and Steve just said, why are you on a bus? <laughs> it's like, I don't know, I'm just trying to figure out who she is. Um, but, but anyway, no, I remember in this, in this camera test that um, it was so subtle and, you know, it's kind of typical Steve. He just said, just sort of was sort of orchestrating the physicality of Alice. We kind of did like a s tiny, tiny microcosmic version of the journey she goes on from being somebody who so internalizes that repression to somebody who takes up space in the world, you know? It's so subtle, but it's, you know, it's interesting. Viola Davis, in her Oscar speech a couple of years ago, said that um, the place where people are gathered with the greatest potential is called the graveyard. It's, it's beautiful. I mean, she's, she said that the, all those stories, I mean, you know, there, what is it like working with someone like that? Someone as, as smart and powerful and, um, and, and actually quite also internalized in all of her, all of her roles. And especially this one, she doesn't smile until, I won't, yeah, I won't give it away. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, shit, sorry. Um, <laughs> hopeless. Um, yeah, Viola is um, a gift to know her and a, a huge privilege to work with her. Um, we were honoring her last night at, at the Glamour Women of the Year Award, and, and I just always have this sense with Viola, it, it sounds really lame, but she's kind of one of these people where you constantly want to get your phone out and, and sort of jot things down in that notes app. Like, can you just say that again? Because I have this feeling that I'm going to want to remember what you just said tomorrow morning when I feel lost, um, or I don't know what I'm doing in life. Um, you know, Viola is this incredible combination of sort of two types of intelligence. She's ferociously intellectually intelligent and incredibly articulate. But her intelligence is so in her body, and you see that in her work. I mean, she, she has this duality where she can deeply articulate something and sort of like so fast too but it's from her heart and in her guts. And um, when you come across somebody like that, I mean, they're rare, you know, specimens. And um, I just soaked up as much as I could, you know. Yeah. Um, I won't give away the, the sort of punchline, but the detail about your character is that she doesn't know how to drive. Do you know how to drive? Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> Listen, look, if someone needed me to drive them to the hospital right now, maybe not in New York, but I probably could, I, mean, I can step on the gas. Um, yeah, no, I can't drive a car. It's really embarrassing. I, the answer is that I, I, I miss my lessons because I was too young when all my friends were learning. And then I just went to acting school in the city and I took the train every day. And now I live in London, so nobody drives. Um, it's really embarrassing. But I love that everyone's like, I mean, Alice goes to the auction and she can't drive. I'm like, yeah, I would totally have done that. 100% would have been like, can you please deliver this car to my house? <laughs> I just get her. I'm, and yeah. In Australia, there are great biking cities too. I mean, sure. Uh, Let's not try and pretend it's not weird and I'm well, not like a hopeless <laughs> person for not being able to. It's bizarre. Um, my friends have a really rough time. I'm like, can you please drive me to the airport? So some questions here from the audience, uh, from Danielle Batista is uh, wanting to know about, this is a good question for actors, how do you master the American accent? Um, practice and dialect coaches. Uh, we had an amazing dialect coach on, on this 
job. Her name's Tanner Marshall. She is the dialect coach for Chicago. Um, I love dialect because it's just a it's a vessel and it's a it's a pathway into your character's psyche. Um, I loved the Chicago accent. I found it very freeing. You know, I'm Australian, so we're kind of flatter and like I always say, it's really hard when I'm on the phone to Americans when they they have good news. You know, my publicist who I adore called me the other day when I was in the in the car and she goes, I've got amazing news, it's, you're doing this thing. And I go, great. And I try to sound excited, but it really sounds so underwhelmed. But I am excited, but I'm Australian. Um, uh, but, you know, like Amer Americans, um, I hate to generalize to an audience of Americans, um, you, you know, tonally and, and the resonance of your accent is so different. So, and, and, um, I'd, and also, you know, Alice is like really the, one of the first times anyone's asked me to play somebody like Alice, some somebody, you know, from a who is sort of from a lower economic socioeconomic background, and and the accent is different, and and and, and I loved that, you know, and that was my such an entry point for me, and I had some pretty great practice sentences, which I still and enjoy. And you do speak sp uh, Polish in one scene, and yeah. you, you yourself are half Polish. Yeah. Was that uh, did, was that something that you have in your in your background, or was that something else you needed to? I don't speak Polish. Um, I go to Poland, and people speak it at me, but it's generally about food, so I just nod. Um, <laughs> but um, I, funnily enough, I asked my cousin to record record the lines that I speak in this, and also record the lines I speak in a Polish accent. Uh, to which she was horrified and said, you can't play this Polish mail order bride. I was like, it's really complicated. I can't explain it, but uh, don't worry. It's better than that. Um, but yeah, no, that's how I did it. There's a question here from, um, also from Danielle about uh, how many, what's your process like in terms of how many takes you want to do or how much re rehearsal time? And speaking of the takes, you mentioned him just a second ago, but um, Sean Bobbitt, the cinematographer, has again outdone himself in this film, there is a, I, I won't spoil for people streaming, but there's a long take in this film that is unlike any, anything I've ever seen before. It's like an art installation in the middle of a mainstream major studio film, but it says so much about Chicago, well, about all cities mm -hmm. and how close we all are to each other, mm -hmm. the rich and the poor. Mm -hmm. um, what about doing a lot of takes? Does Steve like to do a lot of takes? Does he let you kind of do one for yourself, maybe? Uh, it really changes depending on the day or the scene. I mean, Steve is incredibly intuitive, so he, I think he, um, I always think about when Steve is directing, it's almost musical. Um, it's almost like he's he's aware of the rhythm um, of the scene and the musicality of the scene rather than anything that's sort of above the surface level. Um, so if he feels like the swell of the music is sort of yet to be played, uh, he, he'll he keep rolling with it. Um, and I think that I'm like that as an actor as well. If I feel like I, it's not really like crested the wave yet, then I'll want to keep pushing. Um, it's a dance, you know, sometimes we would do many takes, sometimes it was quick. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think about you know, for instance, that scene with Viola, um, you know, we we danced through many sort of variations of that until we found the physicality of it. And um, yeah, and, and Steve does this wonderful thing where once he knows he has it, he comes in and just asks you to just leave it all on the floor, which is obviously always gonna be the best take because you're gonna just yeah. spew up your soul and that's the one he's gonna use, so. And there's a question here from somebody named Catherine. Um, how do you plan on using your Spew position? Spew up your soul. I Spew mean, like, what soul. a terrible... <laughs> I, <laughs> well, I think Steve would like that. Uh, he probably would, yeah. Um, how do you plan on using your position um, of power to support emerging female voices? That's an amazing question. Um, well, I mean, I think that what this film is doing, for instance, and my sort of connection to it is... I personally have never been so proud of, of anything I've made before. Um, I'm really proud of my work in it because of the role I got to play and I think what she says to women and I, I hope that people respond to her. But also what this film shows is that you can make a major motion picture that is both 
art house and commercial um, that's about four women and that people respond to it and they want to see themselves represented on the screen. Um, in terms of how I see my role in the sort of coming years as an actress, I guess it's to, me personally, is, is to be brave enough to play many different women on screen and push the boundaries in terms of the kind of material I'm brave enough to tackle. Because I think what's important is that we don't just see one type of hero story on screen. You know, we have to we have to represent women in a multitude of ways, and that's often playing people who aren't necessarily likable or that challenge our view because the more we start telling stories from a female gaze rather than a male gaze, then the more sort of variation on female experience we're going to be able to put on screen. But I also think it's just about being honest about yourself, like in this kind of scenario now about things that challenge you and things you want to change and things that are in your way still. And I think what we're seeing now with women, certainly on this press tour that we've been doing for this film is there's a new degree of transparency. I mean, it takes a lot of courage to be honest about yourself in this business because there's a lot of forces that want to keep molding you into something palatable. Um, so the braver you can be about yourself and, and listening to people and responding with integrity, I think, is I guess how I hope to keep going. Well, and also, I mean, it just it's so great that Steve, when he decided, he this was based on a television show that he'd seen when he was very young. When he decided that he wanted to adapt it, he went out and found one of the premier novelists and screenwriters, a woman, just to say, Gillian Flynn, who, um, what you just said about complex characters, not always likable. Right. That's, that, that's her, that's she, her she niche. loves that. Yeah, she's an amazing writer, yeah. Was, um, did you get to know her as well? You know, I only met, I'm, I didn't meet Gillian on set. I met Gillian dancing at the rap party. Um, yep, we both had a little bit of wine and we were having a great time. Um, I've since got to know her and she's really, really extraordinary. And speaking of somebody who isn't scared to, to tell the truth about women and to go to dark places that, um, you know, are challenging. I mean, Gillian is kind of really carving that pathway yeah. for us. Yeah, for those who forget, she wrote Gone Girl and, and Sharp Objects. Yeah. Um, yeah so, uh, um, so uh, just to wrap, by just talking about one one last question about that that aspect about a, a a woman taking control of of her life here. Um, you know, the the arc. There's so many arcs, but yours and and yours and Viola's kind of uh, the the relationship that grows there. Yeah. Um, is is just remarkable. Uh, is it is it? Are you spoiled in a way? I mean, it's going to be hard to find something as as substantive as as this, or or is it is it out there? I mean, this is this, sh this shouldn't be a rare case, right? It shouldn't be rare, but it is. Um, I don't like to think that we were spoiled because uh, that implies that we sort of won't have it again. We have to keep pushing for it. It's not necessarily there yet, but I think we're seeing more and more of it. Um, you know, I think that this is a remarkable film because it, it's, it's essentially a conversation about female relationships um, and the complexity of them and, you know, coming to make a movie like this where the four women that we are, I mean, we couldn't be more different from each other as humans, you know, um, and art, life mirrored art mirrored life, you know. Uh, when we first met each other in our little rehearsal room in Chicago, we perceived difference before similarity. Um, and just like the women in this film, you know, and that broke down and we realized how much we had to learn from each other and we, you know, we really, really love each other. I mean, it's it's sort of like a model for how you can make work, you know. It can be female-centric, it can be empowering and you can really love the people you work with. And I think women are more inclined than ever to come together and feel collective power. Um, I'm lost. What was the question? No, I just I mean, love you, them, you, and I get really it. lost when I talk about them. What? Well, and I think what's so special about Steve too is he's made a film that that um, is political, even even though you don't think of it that way. I mean, and you're enjoying it too much, and all the. All I think the you do think. Yeah, I mean, it is incredibly political. Yeah. But it still manages to be a really, really good. Um, but that's what I mean. Thriller. That's the that's the remarkable thing. You know, you're you're sucked into this ride. I mean, when I watched this film for the first time, it feels like a 
a ride. Like you sit in there and the thing goes down and then it's just like a roller coaster. And then that little thing goes at the end and you're like, holy cow, I don't even know what it was. But I think, you know, the other day I was thinking it's almost like a Trojan horse, this film. Like you're being smuggled into something and before you know it, you've been exposed to this sort of unbelievably prolific slice of humanity, like human experience. And and um, I feel like you really learn something about yourself because I think what Steve is trying to do for women and for men watching this is sort of hold a mirror up, um, make us confront things about everything, you know, grief and love. And But I also think what's amazing about this movie is it's political. I mean, we, we go to very, very dark places. We, th we confront violence, police brutality, you know, political corruption, domestic violence, sexual abuse, all these kinds of things. But I think um, he does it through the lens of love, which is pretty remarkable. Um, I don't know, but me making this film and my experience as a woman working with these women and working with Steve, it's sort of like somebody ho holding their hand out and sort of saying, just come and come and think about this for a second and, and learn something about yourself. And I don't know about you, but that's kind of why I want to go to the cinema. So, oh, and it's, it's, it's rare, you know. Yeah, very rare, and, and but very special. So congratulations again. Thank you. And thank you so much for thank being you. here. Thank you.